So I took this photo in Munich in April of this year at the March for Science. And it pictures thousands of scientists standing at the victory gate that guards the entrance to Munich's old town. The monument has stood here since 1852. It's seen peace and it's seen war. It was originally built to commemorate Bavarian soldiers who fought to liberate Germany of Napoleon. But now, 165 years later, we were gathered there, an intellectual army to fight a new enemy. Because we believe that science is under attack. It's under attack by those who undermine our right to ask questions by those who don't know the difference between I believe and I seek to understand, and by those who undermine the knowledge that flows from meticulous study simply because they don't find those answers are palatable. Munich's March for Science, like the sister rallies that were occurring across the world, was pervaded with a sharp awareness of the urgency to advocate for science. We sung songs, and we proudly brandished our signs, and we were standing up for our right to pursue the unbiased discovery of facts, and also to acknowledge the common goals that scientists and non-scientists share, which is to benefit society. Humans are changing this planet faster than ever before, with discoveries that are only possible because of basic scientific discoveries. Scientific facts contribute to the fate of our world by influencing laws, policies, and other critical decisions. So at one point I stood on the stairs of the Munich Library overlooking the crowd, and my hair stood on end, because I realized in that moment what a privilege it was to be there. Scientists reveal information. Information provides knowledge, and knowledge provides power. And therefore, scientists are powerful people. So as I stood on the stairs of the Munich Library and I overlooked the crowd, I wondered, where was everyone else? Where were all the people that use our science to make critical decisions that shape our society? Were they not interested or supportive of how science was contributing to their way of life? Or was it that they weren't being included in a process that greatly impacts them? Scientists may have the power and privilege to understand complex facts. However, I believe that they also have the responsibility to share this power and knowledge with society, because science is for the benefit of everyone. I grew up on the southeast coast of Australia, and it meant that I spent all of my childhood in the outdoors. And I developed this curiosity for the physical world and why things are the way they are. Scientists are question askers and answer seekers, and I had a lot of questions to answer, and so my interest in science continued to grow with me. I was always fascinated with the brain, the fact that it's the controller of our organs and the creator of our personality. But it wasn't until I went to university that I was able to study the brain directly. Now I'm a molecular neurobiologist, and I study the brain every day. I do this using brains that have been donated to science by people that are now passed away. These brain tissues come from brain banks, which are places that exist all around the world to store, anatomically dissect, and verify these brain samples. And then they're distributed in tiny pieces to researchers like me. I use these brain samples to look for molecules, such as genes and proteins, which are altered in people with mental illness. And therefore, a lot of the samples I study come from people that lived with a severe mental illness, such as depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The reason I do this research is because we believe that these alterations in brain molecules is what contributes to the development of mental illness. And so if we can find which molecules are altered, 
It means that we can develop new therapies to potentially correct these alterations in the brain and bring patients relief. One in five people in this audience will experience some form of mental illness in their lifetime. And if mental illness doesn't affect you directly, you'll still be impacted by it. Because these disorders are now so prevalent that it's almost certain that someone close to you will be affected by mental illness, and you'll have firsthand experience with how it shatters not only their lives, but also the people around them. Research like mine helps us to better understand the cascade of events that contribute to the development of mental illness and can help us find ways to prevent and better treat them in the future. It wasn't long after I embarked on my studies that I realized how hard it was to explain to people what I do for work. I'm not that kind of doctor. I don't see patients and I don't work in a morgue. I'm a brain biologist. I do experiments using tiny pieces of brain tissue, no larger than the size of a pea. Albert Einstein is credited with saying that you don't really understand something until you can explain it to your grandmother. And as my knowledge of science superseded that of the public, I realized that most people have a really hard time understanding science or scientific information. And not only my research, but a lot of information that's out there. And it's not because they don't want to, but because the science isn't communicated in a way which is user-friendly. The fact is that science is all around us. You can thank science for your coffee, your beer, your smartphone, the internet, clean water from your taps, your immunity to deadly diseases, your fridge and your microwave. Scientific facts contribute to the fate of our world by shaping laws, policies, and other major decisions. So it's important that society understands the implications of our research, and specifically that they understand the scientific process. That is how basic scientific discoveries are translated into technologies that ultimately change our ways of life. Because it's the public who decide which governments are voted in, which laws are enforced, and which policies are passed. And that means that you also need to understand the importance of scientific research. And so it's not enough for scientists to just provide the information and have utter disregard to how their work is perceived. Scientists must also effectively communicate the meaning and value of their work, because this is the only way we can ensure that important scientific discoveries are not ignored. So it wasn't long after I had this revelation of the importance of scientific communication that I decided that I would start my own blog, and I opened a Twitter account. And I had a goal to deliver my science to anyone with a computer who could read and was interested in what I had to say. So I used my blog to talk about what it's like to use post-mortem brain samples to study mental illness. I used my Twitter to engage the public and answer any questions and also break down complex scientific information into in easy to understand ways. And I used my Instagram account to illustrate what my days in the lab look like. It wasn't long after I started to do this that I started to receive messages from the public. And the one that sticks with me the most came from a father. And he wrote to me that his 26-year-old daughter was suffering with paranoid schizophrenia. And that watching the illness progress was like watching a slow-motion train wreck. And he thanked me and everyone that does research in this area. And I often think about this message because it reminds me of why I'm spending so much of my life in the lab interrogating tiny pieces of brain tissue. It also reminds me that I have the power to reconnect the research with the purpose and ultimately the people that we can help. People have also signed up to donate their brain to research after reading my blog because they better understand how we can help future generations. 
Public forums give the community empowerment to get involved. Medical research is a lot like chipping away at a giant iceberg with a toothpick. It's about asking many, many questions, one after another, and answering these. We need a huge amount of work to make only a tiny step. But if there are enough of us chipping away, we will get to the center of it. And by sharing our journey with you, we can get there even faster. However, the public, you, also share the responsibility that comes with the great knowledge and power that's generated by science. Because it's you who decides which governments are voted in, that determines which laws and policies are passed, and how much funding is, de is devoted to research and science education. So it's also your responsibility to be informed. I grew up watching documentaries on cassette tapes, but these days we have limitless information at our fingertips with the internet. Share them with your families. Use the statistics and the data that we generate to form your arguments and make your decisions. Instead of saying that you believe, say that you understand. And scientists, as we're going about our research, let's make sure that we're still involving our friends and families and communities in the conversation. Because it's up to us to make sure that we're getting the science from the Einsteins to the grannies. So as I stood on the stairs of the Munich Library and I overlooked the street, my view changed. Because in that moment, I saw that there were also families and children's present. And I knew that people do care and they do want to be involved. Thomas Jefferson once said that information is the currency of democracy. And by working together, we can redefine the relationship between science and the public and work together to make real scientific contributions that benefit not only scientists, but our society as a whole. Thank you.